Please join me in the spirit of prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week in worship, I shared that we lost our dog, Lucky, to cancer. I took him to a vet on a Tuesday, and he made it until Friday. And it was heart-wrenching. And while people make lots of different decisions regarding getting new pets after they lose one, I have to say I wasn't willing to give up the unconditional love that a dog provides during our grieving process, plus there's lots of practical logistical things like my partner works a school year calendar, so once she goes back to work, having a new pet would be particularly hard. And I don't know, it just feels like there's so much ick in the world right now. I didn't want any more ick. So right away, of course, I started looking for a puppy. And you can judge me, that's fine. But we started looking for a puppy. And oddly enough, if you've gotten a puppy before, you'll know that typically it takes months to get a puppy. Like you get yourself on a waiting list and then you send a deposit and then the breeder meets you and, and all those things. But during COVID, I think breeders were like, ooh, people want puppies. <laughs> so breeders had a lot of puppies. And quite a few pups have not been claimed yet. And so they were really ready to go. And I have... I have allergies, so we have to be really picky about our puppies. We, Nora would love to just go to the Humane Society and get a puppy, but when you have allergies, that doesn't work so well. But sure enough, I found um, Woodle puppies. Woodle puppies, yes, W-H-O-O-D-L-E, Woodle puppies. So they're Wheaton Terriers, which is what our dog Lucky was, and Poodles mixed together. Now, Wheaton Terriers are lovely, wonderful, funny, hyper dogs. They are not smart at all. <laughs> you would call Lucky and he would go to whatever person was close to him, not whoever had called him. He was, he was not smart. Poodles, of course, are known to be a bit smarter. So we thought, okay. And both are hypoallergenic as much as a dog can be. So there were Woodle puppies in Attleboro, Massachusetts, and not only were they ready to go, but they were a little bit older because there's too many puppies, so they had been born in March, so instead of being eight weeks old, they're 15 weeks old. That actually makes a really big difference in the life of a puppy and uh, how easy they are to train. So on Friday, we took a ride to Massachusetts and met the next furry member of our family, Millie the Woodle. And just as an aside, it's not a good idea to pick up a puppy on a Friday night south of Boston when you then need to drive back north of Boston. <laughs> we made it. Nora kept saying to me while we were on 128, we need to stop. I was like, yeah, <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> so we did, we did stop. The poor puppy had never had a collar on before, so when we took the puppy out of the car to go to the bathroom, which it piddled as we were taking her out of the car. Leather seats, not fancy leather seats, old leather seats, so that was okay. But she, she basically just pancaked and then commando crawled around the small piece of grass. And then about an hour and a half later, when I was in the back of the car, I looked over and there was a large pile of barf. So given that we had to go so long in the car, I think she did pretty, <laughs> pretty well. Now we loved our dog Lucky and we brought him home when our boys were seven. We have twin boys. Three out of four people in our house have ADHD. Lucky the puppy also had ADHD, <laughs> which meant he learned some things and not others. We did teach him, if you have been exposed to Wheatons before, they jump, they're jumpers. So we did manage, I don't know how, to teach him not to jump when he greeted people. Um, but we didn't master crate training. Like, that was just one thing we couldn't quite do. Like, we put him in the crate and the crying was, you know, we had crying seven-year-olds and a crying puppy and people all over the place and it just didn't happen. So he won his freedom and we lost our hope of crate training. So this time, we are resolved to do it differently. 
And because of her age, Millie is already partially crate trained, so perfect, right? How, how hard could this be? So on Friday night, after a long drive home, the realization that she's never had a collar on, so we're trying to direct her to a place to do her business is a bit of a challenge. And in inaugural fall off, we have these little steps off our deck for our dogs to go into the side yard while she she found the steps, she understood the steps, she didn't understand getting her clumsy feet onto the steps, so she took her first, you know, acrobatic tumble off the steps into the side yard. We were ready for the crate. So we managed to successfully get her into the crate. We also had to endure whining and crying for an hour or so at the beginning. And then in the middle of the night, it was a two hour, two and a half, three hour episode of whining and crying. If you've done that before, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. And the thing they tell you is do not let your dog out of the crate while it's whining and crying, right? So like, good luck with that. Like, how does that work? Like the dog is whining and crying to get let out of the crate. Like how do you get it to stop whining and crying so you can let it out of the crate so you didn't just teach it that if it whines and cries, you'll let it out of the crate. So I'm not sure that Millie was quite as crate trained as the breeder led us to believe. Remember, there, are, there were four puppies from uh, Millie's litter that were still available, and there was a new litter. <laughs> so she was ready for Millie to find her new home. But we did discover something. Now, when we picked Millie up, we picked, we picked Millie because she was super social. So she immediately came over to Nora and I and interacted with us. She was licking us, laying on us, and on the way home, she like got next to us in the seat. We couldn't bear to crate her in the car. You should, but we couldn't, <laughs> not on the first ride. So she was next to us in the seat and put one paw here and one paw here with her head here like she was hugging us on the way home. I think she might have just been motion sick, but. So, super social, right? So here she is crying in the crate. We're trying to like keep an eye on her but not let her know like we're responding to her crying in the crate. So just kind of walking around making noise. As soon as she could hear us, as soon as she knew we were around, she would sit silently with her tail flapping against the crate hoping we would come free her. It's fascinating, right? I mean, it was like, huh, who knew? I, I had no idea. So this morning's scripture, this does have something to do with the scripture, by the way. <laughs> Although I really do like telling you about my new puppy, and we, I am hoping to bring her, uh, she has the temperament to come to work, so I'm hoping, hoping you all have the chance to meet Millie. So the disciples are on a boat, and a storm is brewing, and the water is getting choppy and rough, and the disciples are afraid. This is the story we read, right? I had a bit of a, like, it's really hot in here, and I was trying to get all the buttons right. <laughs> I was like, I hope this matches up. So they're kind of freaked out. You might even think, like, they might be whining and crying. And then they see something on the water that they don't recognize. So I want you to think about if you've ever been in a situation like this. Like you're already afraid or upset about something and then one more thing comes that you're like really not sure of, like you can't discern it. Or like when you look, have you ever looked at something and you're like, I'm clearly sure I'm not sure what I'm looking at. <laughs> like has that ever happened to you? Like I've had that with like, perspectives, like when you look at something and it's at the wrong angle, you think you're looking at one thing or you're looking at something else. Anyway, so think about that. Like, you're already afraid and upset. Something else is entering the picture that you're unclear what it is. Your heart starts to race even faster. Your fear rises. What now? And in this case, what the disciples saw was Jesus. And I love scripture because there are so many possibilities of what we focus on. So Sue mentioned the lesson that we can learn in the walking on the water. 
right? The idea that there's mystery that's beyond us. And that's absolutely a part of this story. And it's often what we focus on in this story. And it's a really little tiny, like, four-word mention of Jesus walking on the water. But there's also this part of the story that the disciples remain afraid until Jesus identifies himself. Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. And it is, it is I can also be um, equated to I am who I am in the Old Testament. So the idea is it's God announcing God's self, right? So Jesus is approaching the disciples. He's close enough that they're not able to, that they, you know, they aren't sure who he is. It's kind of freaking them out. And suddenly he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. And they take him into the boat. That's how close he was to them. Now, I'm not sure. Think about this. Would the story have been the same if he had, like, been waving to them from way across the way, like, hey, I see you all freaked out over there. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Right? No, he was right there with them. They take him into the boat and they finish their journey. Okay, here's my silly little connection. Millie the Woodle's calmness when we are just near, her awareness that it is I, we're not her God, but you know what I mean. We're her people. Calmed her right down. And so it reminds me of the power of presence. And there's two pieces going on here, right? There's the power of what it means when we recognize and accept God's presence. That's what we're seeing in the story. But then we also need to remember the power of what it means when we offer presence. Presence is a really, really powerful thing. And so even though this is a silly little example, I want you to think of those times in your life when you've experienced that. Because with Millie, it is so clear, right? I'm upset, I'm upset, I'm upset. Oh, you're around. Oh, good. Quack, 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 right? <sighs> this morning's scripture reading helps remind me of what can happen when we recognize and invite God's presence into our experience. There is a reassurance, a steadfastness, a companionship that helps us make it to the next shore. It helps us push through our fears to what is next. And so my prayer for all of us this morning is that we seek to discover God in whatever way God accompanies us and that we may receive God's presence such that we experience that peace, that tail wagging all is good peace that makes the way for us to continue our journey. Amen.